So today, we are continuing our series through Ephesians, and we're getting close. Final chapter, we're getting just a few more messages here. It's been an awesome ride, but, uh, but eventually we're going to have to do something else. Um, but, but today, I have the honor of continuing our conversation about the armor of God. And uh, so I, I chose a version of the Bible that I normally don't use. Uh, if there's some people in here that are like, well, what's, what's the difference? Um, well, I mean, I, I heard some, some translations in the, the Amazon jungle where they didn't have a word for, for book. And so they translated it leaf because they would always write things on a leaf. And they would use that word leaf so that they would understand versus trying to write this huge, long paragraph about, you know, how they opened up the book of, of the word. And so um, this, this translation, uh, I mean, Primarily, I wanted to use the, the, the phrase, gird up our loins. Like, um, like, there's something about just putting on a belt of truth that seems kind of passive. But, but I want to talk about how we're going to gird up our loins with truth. So if you're wondering why I use this version, um, that, that is why. So uh, if you got your Bibles, open it up to Ephesians chapter 6. And I'm going to read the whole passage in context. And then we'll, we'll start picking it out. Piece by piece. So starting in verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, Take up the full armor of God so that you'll be able to resist the devil in the evil day. And having done everything to stand firm. I want to stop just there for a second. The, once again, this is a translation. It wasn't written in English. It was written in Greek. And, and the, the Greek word there for stand firm alludes to um, at the end of the battle, those who are left standing, those are the ones that stood firm to the end. And so, so in that phrase, it means to stand firm to the end, the last men standing, or last women standing too. So we want to, the, the very next verse, it once again says, Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth, oh yeah, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, in, a, in addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you'll be able to extinguish, extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. So that first word, stand firm, that stand firm in the Greek means to take the battle line, to make that decision, I am going to join this battle. So isn't that amazing that, that just, just one sentence, all of a sudden it says, we want to stand firm in, in a victorious manner. This is how you get the victory. And the very next line is, therefore, take the battle line. And so what we're going to talk about today is what it looks like to put on truth, to put on righteousness in a way where we get to take the battle line, where we get to join the fight. So I know we just prayed for, for Rwanda, but I want to I pray for what God is doing here in this room, and, uh, and then we'll continue. So God, I just pray that every person here be given the grace to understand what you want them to know this morning. God, I pray that you would give them the ability and the courage to take these words, to put them into their life, put them into practice. God, that, that your scripture would become alive in them today. That all of us would just see you and experience you and experience your Holy Spirit. God, we love you. And we just want to see your name lifted high above any other name. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. So we're talking about the armor of God. And, and let's, let's be honest, we're, we're joining into a spiritual battle. And, and so like, I don't know, maybe, maybe you think you're very strong. But that's not going to help you in this battle. 
Maybe you think that, that you're, you're, you're fast or you're a tactical genius. But in this battle, that's not going to help you. But what will help you is God's weapons because this is a, this is a supernatural battle. And so what Jesus or what, what the, the Holy Spirit is speaking through Paul is, is this is what we need to do to fight this battle and be victorious. All right? And so um, the, the image is of a Roman centurion putting, putting on his, his battle equipment. And this is something that, that everyone would, would, in their time, understand very well. The, the Roman centurions were by far the, the most technologically advanced uh, warriors in the world at that time. And, and so if you had the equipment, like half the job was done for you. It was incredibly valuable, and, and, and just, just having this equipment gave you a huge advantage above everything, above everyone else. And so we want to join this supernatural battle. Um, in 1 Corinthians 10, 12, it, it gives a warning about trying to do this on our own. Um, so you, if you think you are standing firm, be careful so that you don't fall. I think there is a danger here in in hearing a, a pep talk about how we're, we're victorious in Christ and, and go off and try to do it on your own strength. Uh, maybe you have your own experiences. I have mine. It doesn't work. On our own strength, we fall. So what does this mean? I, I want to read that, that phrase one more time. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth. What does it mean to gird? Like I said, like I, I didn't want to use just the, the phrase belt of truth because I, I don't think that's, that really communicates to you and me what, what, what Paul is talking about. This isn't just something we clip on. Like maybe you're familiar with the phrase girdle, like this, this garment that sort of covers everything in this general region. Gird is where we get that phrase from. The, the, the garment that, that is being talked about is this wrapping. It's a covering all the intimate places, and, and it's something that, that we're supposed to, to wear very close to us. Um, there, there's also a phrase that I don't know if this was intentional by Paul or not, but the, the concept is if you have a long cloak that, that goes down by your ankles, you can't really walk much faster than this. I mean, maybe you could kind of do one of these little shuffle things, um, but, but it, it doesn't really work. And so what they would do is they would lift it up and they would tie it in this magical bow, and, and that way they could, they could work or they could go to war, they could battle. And so that's, that's what this is talking about, to, to gird up your, your cloak, to gird up and then bring it close to you, to wrap tightly, to make it a part of you. So I think a lot of us, when we think about truth, it's not quite that intense. If, if I had to say what truth was to, to myself growing up, even as somebody growing up in the church, for me, truth was kind of like, you know, those Velcro flag football things. You know what I'm saying? That, that sometimes if, if I just kind of moved too quick, they would just kind of slip off. I, I, I had this uh, philosophy class at, in college, um, and this, this was at College of DuPage, and I just thought philosophy would be really interesting. And the very first day of class, the professor said, so today, I'm going to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that Christianity is not real and, and that religion of any kind is just made up by man. And he started asking these questions, and it was the first day of class. I wasn't Captain Zeal back then. Um, I, just, I just saw this whole thing playing out. And there were these two, two people in the back of the class, you know, they, they're like, well, uh, I'm a Christian, so um, I don't agree with this conversation. And he just dismantled every thought that they had systematically over the, the next hour and a half. And after class, I looked back, and I, I saw them, like, just shocked and dismayed. And um, it, was, it was a guy and a girl. I don't know if they were brother, sister, boyfriend, girlfriend, or just friends. But the girl was just crying. She was just heartbroken. And the professor said, oh, hold, hold, hold on. T tomorrow, we'll, beyond a shadow of a doubt, prove that Christianity is real. It's Okay. But, but I realized in that moment that the truth that they held so dear was not very anchored, was not very tested, was not proven. 
I would, I would dare say that they, they didn't have it girded up, that it wasn't wrapped around them so tight that it became part of them. I think that, that when we're talking about truth to this level, we're talking about having our core beliefs, the truth, the, the, the thoughts that aren't just fleeting, but the thoughts that become part of us. They, they become who we are. And so I want to give you a couple examples. Like, like if somebody said, like polled a bunch of Christians or even our church, so what, what's your views on, on reading the Bible? I think many people would say, you know, it's, it's good. Or they would say, yeah, I think you should do it every day. But, but what is your core belief? What do you truly believe about reading the word? Because if your core belief was, it is bread to me, and without it, I, I spiritually die a little bit. Like if, if that was something that you really took as, as true, which I believe the Bible says, you know, the, the word of God is, it's, it's our bread. It's, it's, it's how we live. It's how we grow. How are we going to know God unless we know his word? And if we, if we took that truth and we girded it up, if we started to wrap it around us, made it part of who we were, I think our lives would be very different. Or, or what about this one? I, I want to I hit guys uh, in, the, in the difficult place right here. Uh, what, what if people just held to the truth that porn is bad? Pornography is bad. I think many people would say, yeah, pornography is bad. Especially in the Christian church, like at least there would be a little piece of them that says, yes, porn is bad. But what if you held a, a deeper truth and held it close that, that pornography is addictive, destructive, and evil, and it has no place in my life because I honor my, my God and I honor my wife with my eyes, my mind, and my heart. You see the difference? One is a passive truth that does no good in the battlefield, the spiritual battlefield. And the other belief is powerful. And it, and it, it is a, a weapon it is, it is something that will protect us. It was something that will beg questions as people interact with us. If, if people ask us, so what do you think about porn? And you give that answer, whoa. Like, you're intense. I am intense. I think a lot of people have a lot of truth that they leave like the robe lying down. Or they, they, did, they haven't really worn it. Should I give people the benefit of the doubt? Should I worship God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength? Really? I think there's, there's a lot of truths that, that we haven't held close. But if we are going to stay victorious in this battle... What Paul is, is declaring through the Holy Spirit is that we need to take this truth and bring it close to us. So that's no longer just thoughts, that it's, it's something that we know, that we believe, that we're passionate about. It's, it's not even just knowing the answers to the questions. I think there's a lot of brilliant people out there that love Jesus. But the, the truth is, is they, they know the questions and they know the answers, but their lives aren't begging people to ask the questions and their lives aren't telling the answers. I, I just started a new job not too long ago. I can't even tell you how much I don't know. I don't even know the questions to ask because I don't know what I don't know. And there's a world out there that has no idea how much Jesus loves them. How, how God has called them to be sons and daughters. They, they don't even have that in their mind. They don't even know how to ask the questions. And so they're not asking the questions. But what if... We held truth so close to us that our lives just started asking the questions for us. I think you would find yourself on the battle line much more often than, than you currently are or we currently are. So that's truth. Righteousness. This is not just the avoidance of sin. Right? I, I think that's I, the, the good Christian thought is righteousness is not doing bad things. 
but, but that's only half right. I, uh, I, I really think that, that righteousness is something far more powerful than that. It's, I mean, ultimately, at the end of the day, righteousness is the requirement for getting into heaven. So, I mean, I, I guess, you know, we're, we're talking about put on the breastplate of righteousness, put on the breastplate of, of perfection. What if that was like the, the, the prerequisite for every job? Okay, so uh, I want you to be perfect in everything, in every way. Good luck. But, but for us to stand firm to the end, we're told to put on this breastplate of righteousness, to wear it. How can that be? Well, um, the, the, the good news is that uh, righteousness is attainable, not by our own strength, not by our own um, efforts. We, we can't even just avoid doing no wrong. I, I think righteousness is far beyond just not doing anything wrong. I think it's about doing the right thing in the right moment. So even if you even if you actually really genuinely care about other human beings and you're not um, apathetic to their needs? What if you just don't surrender everything and, and, and give it to them? Like there, there is a righteousness that is far above and beyond our own ability, capability, and God is calling us to, to this. And thank you, Jesus, that then Romans 3, uh, it, it talks about it a little bit more so we can understand it. And so this is uh, starting in verse 21. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested. Thank you, Jesus. Being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. There is no distinction, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There is a righteousness. There is a perfection. There is a, um, we are seen blameless in the eyes of God. And, and our actions are made beautiful and holy in his sight, not because of what you've done, not because of what I've done, but because of what Jesus has done. But here's the thing. We, we, we have to choose to put that on. It, it is a choice. Like, I, I, I talk to a lot of people, and, and they're like, oh, man, like, I'm just a sinner saved by grace, which sounds fantastic. It's so humble. It's like, yeah, man, I'm just, I'm just a sinner, but God, and, uh, you know, which... What they said on a behavioral level is so true. I've sinned, they've sinned, we've all sinned. All have fallen short of the glory of God. So true. Fact. But that is not an identity level belief. Right? So, so fr- from an identity point of view, we want to make sure that, that we're putting on righteousness. Like I, I don't put on the breastplate of, of, like, of s- sin. I put on the breastplate of righteousness. That's what protects me. I am made righteous because of what God has done. We get to put on this breastplate. But it, it's, it's a choice, right? So like, you can choose to believe that you're just a sinner saved by grace, or you can choose to believe that I'm righteous, thank you, Jesus, for what you have done. And I think that radically transforms the way that we see ourselves, that transforms the way that other people see us. And according to the word of God, it protects us from the schemes of the enemy so that we can stand firm to the end. That's who you are. You're somebody who is righteous because of what Jesus has done. You are somebody who is made whole because of what Jesus has done. You are somebody that gets to take truth and wrap it around yourself so that you are able to stand firm to the end. So now, it's time to do it. It's time to take up this this mantle. There are two many of us and I'm guilty of this as well, where we are doing things for God, but we are not in the battle. And there's a big difference between being in the battle and, and, and just being part of a Christian community. And uh, I'll, I'll never forget the first time I got a chance to, to go to Africa. 
And um, I, I prayed for a number of people and I, they got healed and I was just blown away. And at the end of this awesome night where God was just moving, they brought me this woman who they said, oh yes, she has a demon. Okay, yeah, pray for her. No, we would like you to pray for her. Isn't there somebody more qualified? Because like I don't really, this isn't my specialty. I'm more into like backs and blind eyes. That's my thing. Um, so, but I, so I had no concept. Like I wasn't prepared. I didn't have like a whole bunch of scriptures queued up. And, and I, all of a sudden, I'm in the battle. I'm in the battle. And uh, I, I remember in that moment just going, it, it didn't feel right to do this, this, this exorcism. I think that's the, the right phrase, right? Exorcism. I didn't feel that, that, that doing it the way that they did it in Africa was the way that God wanted me to do it. And, I, and so I just wanted to obey God. And, and I remember just looking at this person who was writhing and making sounds and scratching herself and, and she was strong. She was abnormally crazy strong. And, and, and I remember just loving her. I hated whatever was doing this to her, but I loved her. And so I just, I just remember just going, shh, 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 you need to leave. In the name of Jesus, let this girl go. She's free. And I just kept doing that for like 15, well, maybe it was like two minutes, but it felt like 15 minutes. <laughs> And then all of a sudden, she was, she was fine. And she cleaned the spit and snot off her face. And uh, she straightened up and she just walked away. And it wasn't until six months later I got a chance to go back to the place. We had a gospel festival. And, and I was just standing in the back of the church during a worship service. And I felt this little tug on my shirt. And this lovely lady you know, all cleaned up and just very eloquently said, thank you, you changed my life. There's, there's a battle that's, that's being waged and you are in it whether you're ready for it or not. And, and we're all drafted. Every single one of us, we're, we're drafted to be in this, this battle. But, but, here, but here's the crazy, awesome thing. It's, it's less of a draft to hope we win since we already know that victory is ours. So, so you're being drafted into the opportunity to become part of the victory. You know what I'm saying? There, it's different. We're not like hoping that we win. We know how it ends. We know the outcome. And so there's absolutely zero fear of whether or not we're going to win or lose. It is an opportunity. It is a calling to become part of this battle. I, uh, I have the, the awesome opportunity to um, be a part of this, this group from our church. We call it Street Lib. And on Thursday nights we go out and we just love on people. I, I call it Street Lib because it's just love, inspire, and bless. And, and, and Lib sort of has this kind of allusion to, to liberty, to be free, to be liberated. And, and there are so many people. I live in downtown Aurora, a lot of needy people there, and rarely do we get much more than two blocks away from my house before we find somebody that is in desperate need of the love of God. The, the battlefield is right outside our door. It's right inside your workplaces. It's, it's in this church. There are people that are, are, are crying out for you to take the battle line. And so what are, what are the truths that God has given you to hold close? You know, I love bragging about my, my wife. She's awesome. For her, people living in poverty is not okay. That that is not acceptable and that, that, that there's something that she can do about it and so she's going to do something about it. And she has a conviction of that and a skill set that allows her to combat poverty in a way that, that, I, that few other people are able to. You know, me, I love seeing people recognize the fact that, that, that God has mercy and grace on them and has called them, even in the middle of their brokenness, to sing praises to him and just glorify him and, and say, you are my daddy. And become their son, his son or, or his daughter. That, that's what I want to see more than anything else in the world. What is the passion that God has put in you? 
What are the tools that God is calling you to bring to the battle? I think there's something very specifically in you that no one else has. The, Steve talked on this a number of, of months ago. The things that bug you most are might maybe the thing that you need to bring to the battle. The thing that you are most passionate about, the thing that, that you don't see anyone else really taking up with all of their passion, maybe it's because it's time for you to take that up with passion. Yeah. It's time to take a stand. I guarantee victory. I guarantee it. I think... Uh, I think God has very special things in, in store for our church. As, as I meet with other people, as I talk with them, there, there's a special grace on this church. There's a special anointing on this church. And I, I don't think that's really much from what we've done. I, I think that's primarily because God just called us and we're willing to say okay. And, and so like I, I love being able to preach a message like this to a church knowing that you guys are, are probably going to respond. I think there's a lot of churches where we would preach a message like this and there would be pushback, there would be resistance, but, but we, we have a church that wants everything that God has for them. I love that. I love that. I love you guys. So I want everyone to stand to their feet. I'm going to invite the, the band to come on up. I think what God wants to do here is, is sort of a, an activation. Now, many of you are serving in so many awesome ways. I don't want you to think that I'm, I'm belittling your service. I mean, I, our church serves. We, we love people. We love um, you know, just, just giving our gifts to our church, to our community. We, we care for one another. I, I don't want you to think even for a second that I don't honor you and love you and respect the gifts that you're giving and the sacrifices that you're making. Thank you so much. I, I'm, I'm just saying there is an intentionality that this passage calls us to, to take in regard to being part of a spiritual war and a spiritual battle. And so what I would love to happen this morning is if we all leave here knowing that, that God has given us truth. Even if that truth is just Jesus is king and he is in charge and he has given us his word. That, that's a great start. Even if the, the truth is, is just knowing I am a son, I am a daughter of the living God and he has called me to be a part of his army and we win. That's a great, that's a great start. But I think there's also some, some other things that God wants us to, to know that, that we don't have to be locked down by guilt and condemnation because we are righteous in his eyes. Jesus looks at you and he sees a righteous man. He looks at you and sees a righteous woman. And so what Jesus is calling us to do today is become part of the battle. So let's just lift up our hands towards heaven, close our eyes if, if, if you're, you're able to do that. And let's just pray. God, I pray right now, Jesus, in your name, that you give us the courage, that you give us the conviction, that you give us the, the desire to see your kingdom come to earth in a powerful, powerful way. We want that so badly that we're willing to join the fight. God, this battle is a battle not just for ourselves, but for our family, for our friends, for our country, for this world. And we do not believe that Satan gets to push us around anymore. We do not believe that he has this authority over us because we have given all that to you, Jesus. All authority, all glory, all the honor belongs to you, Jesus. And so we stand with you. So right now, Jesus, in your name, I pray that you activate these soldiers for you. 
that strength and courage and conviction and truth and, and the knowledge of righteousness, that faith, that, that righteousness is ours thanks to you, Jesus, will become part of who we are, that we would wear it like armor, that we would believe it as true. More than we believe that, that our name is our name, we would believe that Jesus is the name above every name, that, that you, Jesus, are, are coming and, and you're coming in power and that your Holy Spirit is here with us. Your Holy Spirit is causing us to, to just draw nearer to you. That your kingdom is crashing into earth. And that is powerful. And there's no force of the enemy, no weapon formed against us can, pro can prosper because we call you Father. Jesus, thank you for this church. Thank you for this morning. Thank you for this time. God, we love you. I pray. That, that even as we worship, that you bring scriptures to mind, that you bring missions to mind, that you just launch us into a lifetime of fighting this battle, to, to join the fight, and to sing victory all over the world. Thank you, Jesus. We give you all the thanks and praise. Amen. Amen.